My name is Moan Cerf. I'm an associate professor here at Kellogg, and I'm a neuroscientist by training, and I teach how to use neuroscience in the context of business. I'm uh, biased a little bit, but I think that uh, what's happening gradually is that more and more computational social scientists are realizing that they need to look at the brain to understand behavior and uh, that the brain is coding many of the things that we explained before using psychology. So we're looking at things like machine learning, which is a buzzword that is really popular right now among computational social scientists. If you try to kind of track the origin of this word, it's actually coming from neuroscience. It's how the brain learns. Uh, this is true for a lot of terms like deep learning and generally neural networks and many of the things that uh, are out there in the field, they come from neuroscientists who didn't know that uh, their tools would be used for anything but explaining the brain's behavior. That's kind of the methods part. And on the behavior part, generally, I think that we're starting to look into the brain and realizing that a lot of the anomalies of behavior can be explained there. So I'll give you an example that's concrete. For a while, there's this uh, field that's growing called the, uh, behavioral economics, which tries to predict how people will do things when they do them in ways that are irrational. So they're supposed to go right, but they go left because somehow something made them go left that they could not explain perfectly. And when we look at the design of the structure, we figure out that we could predict that. Behavioral economics has given us a lot of explanations to people's behavior, but it also fails in two domains. It fails to explain why are we doing things that are irrational? Which, because when we tell us what we did, we say, oh, I want to change. And also it doesn't help us change. So we make mistakes again and again, and we can't fix them. And what we're learning is that if you take one step back and you look at the brain, you can actually predict the behavior and even understand what is the root of the behavior. And you can actually change. You can actually take a person the extreme version of that, bring her over to the lab, have her take a nap of two hours and wake up different. And that is where we're aiming right now, taking the fields that propagate in computational and social science, but adding the strawberry or the icing on the cake that will actually explain things fully. I think that uh, we're beginning to understand the nature of something that is profound, which is what humans are for, and what is the future of humanity? That's a big opening. I think that up to now, we kind of looked at our lives uh, in the context of history and tried to draw conclusions from where we're going. But for the first time, we're starting to take ownership of the future. We're saying, okay, uh, evolution took that many years to get us to become who we are right now. And if we want to have wings uh, and we rely on evolution to do it, it's gonna take millions of years and probably not gonna be in our lifetimes. But wait, we know how to do it ourselves. So suddenly we can take ownership of evolution and build things for us right away. When we think about learning, for a while learning was a thing that we tried to get better, but we try to improve the school system or education or small scale things. And now we say, wait, what is learning? It's actually getting content into the brain. Maybe we can just do it efficiently by plugging things directly. Communication. Uh, if you take a person from the you know, 100,000 years ago, Neanderthals, they still use their mouth to speak. This is one of the few things that didn't change at all in the last 100,000 years. We're still using the same methods to communicate. But we're realizing right now that communication is just taking an idea in my brain and putting it in your brain, and language is just the most efficient thing we had up to now. Now it's time to say, wait, we can do better. We can actually connect the brains using alternative ways and communicate ideas directly. And in doing so, we actually aren't just communicating ideas perfectly, moving thought from one place to another perfectly, we're also speeding up this thing. When I speak, even though I speak very fast, I probably speak up to, you know, 150 words per minute. That is really slow compared to how fast my brain can think. My brain can think about anything between 450 thoughts per minute, or some say if it's just visual thoughts, it's 60,000. So we can really do things much faster and we're slowed by our old way of communicating. So here is a way that we can improve that. And that's, that's not just a mechanical way. It's actually entirely changing the way humans are going to interact because, and this is where I'm going to uh, end this kind of inspiring thinking about the future. Many people think that what makes human kind unique, 
what makes us the crown of creation, what makes us stand out in nature, is that we have a component in our brain that no other animal has that allows us to not just live in the moment, but actually reflect on things, uh, think about the future and imagine futures that aren't there and really know without even trying that uh, ice cream that will uh, be made of olive oil might not be as tasty as one made of vanilla. We don't need to taste it. We can just imagine it and it's going to work. But it also allows us to invent complex ideas and share them without actually having a physicality to them. Ideas like democracy. It doesn't, it doesn't exist really, like we can't wear it or eat it, but I can invent it in my mind, tell you, and you and I live through a world with that. We can invent complex ideas like the blockchain or whatever, things that you hear a lot of people speaking about, they don't really exist in the sense that they're anything but an idea. You can't communicate it to a puppy because they just don't have any sense of things that aren't physical or aren't tangible. And in that sense, humans have spiked in evolution because we started to believe in things that were much complex and living through them this is a network of social ideas social people living by ideas that actually communicate them this is like what a lot of the world that we live in right now is enjoying memes and and complex uh, concepts that tra travel faster than anything else when we realize that this is one of the powers of humanity to have those ideas and that they actually create a network of humans that is bigger than an individual i think we're seeing a the idea of where it could go. It could go into a world where humans become one big entity rather than many, many units of individuals. I'm trying to think about neuroscience in the context of business. And this is what I'm doing here at Kellogg. And one of the things that I'm doing that is relevant is I'm trying to see if there's a power to many brains that is bigger than the power of individual brain in solving problems that uh, are difficult for us to inter introspect on alone. So I'll give you an example that's concrete. Uh, when you watch a movie and I am the filmmaker and I want to know if the movie is good. There are many ways I can know that. I can uh, see if you recommended your friends to go watch it. I can see if you paid for the, uh, you know, the second movie that comes out in the series. I can also ask you and I can also have people with dials do that. But what we learned is that all of those are not really reliable. Turns out that sometimes people really want to watch a movie, but there's another one that's actually good and they go to watch the other one. And your movie lost not because it's not good, just because there's another one that's also as good coming out. Maybe people uh, don't remember things down the line. Uh, maybe people are biased by the ending. It's really a really boring movie, but she fell in love with the vampire in the end and we immediately say, oh, it's amazing. I loved everything. So, so a lot of things go into that and, and a movie is just an example I gave it to for music, a conversation, any experience that uh, is kind of dynamic is really something that's hard for us to introspect on because to do it properly, we need to stop the experience and ask about it while you're going through it. So if I want to know how interesting I am to you right now, the best way to do it is to stop right now and to ask you. But in doing that, I already ruined something because the experience is no longer lived, but it's kind of reflected on. So the question is, is there a way for us to look at an experience and know whether you're enjoying it, whether it's interesting for you without asking you and without stopping it and without waiting to the end uh, and wait to see how you reflect on the entire history and maybe be mistaken by the end. Turns out that the answer to how interesting I am to you and how interesting this experience is, is in our brain. And if I can read it from your brain directly while you go through it, I don't have to stop you. And that is what we're trying to do. But what we learned is that turns out it's really, really hard to ask one brain. So if I just look at your brain, it's really hard to know. Like there's going to be a lot of things there that are going to up and down. And there's going to be moments when we talk that your brain is going to be metaphorically very silent, which I would say, oh my God, she's really bored. But actually this silence is what lives, uh, what makes you kind of take a pause if you want, so you can enjoy the moment after much more. So all of those uh, kind of moments of, of silence or, or increase in activity are actually part of the entire experience. And if we just try to look at them as like moment to moment, we would be mistaken. What we found is that the best way to actually know if an experience is good is to look at many, many brains who went through the experience simultaneously. So if I want to know if the movie is really, really good, I shouldn't just look at one brain, but I should look at the entire room, all the brains of all the audiences, and see how similar they are to each other. The more similar they are to each other, the better the movie is, because the movie was able to tap into every person's brain in the same way, despite who they are. So an old person, a young girl, a... I can't, like a, people who love the movie, people who hate the movie, somehow, when they see a Hitchcock film, they all look the same. Their brains look the same because he was a master in tapping into everyone's brain, figuring out who we really are and making us all look alike. So our brains kind of move in the same waves, including the silences, are perfectly crafted by him. Mozart's 
genius was that he could sit in his room and kind of compose something knowing somehow how the brains of many, many millions of people would look years after he was dead. Somehow the genius of people is to be able to realize how to go into people's brains. So what we see is that if you look at many brains and you see how similar they are, you can actually know how good the content they experienced is. So this is the one of the first time that we realized that I can't look at one brain, but I can look at a group of brains and measure not their response to the movie, but how they look together. And as a group, there's a lot more information there that tells me that the movie was good or bad. More similar, better movie. Less similar, less good, less engaging movie. Two for conversations, for music, for political opinions, anything you can imagine. We can figure out by looking at many people's brain who they're going to vote for, how they're going to change their mind, what's going to affect them, what they're going to find emotional, what not, what they're going to find uh, annoying. All of that by just looking at how similar their brains are. I mentioned looking at the brain. The brain controls the heart rate and the respiration and skin conductance and your eye movement. So one of the things we look at is all kinds of residuals, proxies of the brain, and they all become very much alike to the extreme version that some of the uh, scientists to look at right, that right now found that if you go back to movies as a really good kind of test bed for content and how interesting it is, the air conditioner in the movie theater if you put a sensor in, you can actually know how good the movie is by the effect of the movie on everyone else because they all gasp at the same time and they suck the air from the uh, room and you can actually figure out which movie they're watching just by looking at the air conditioner. They all kind of sigh in the same moment. They all uh, emit some smells and some odors from their body when they get sweaty or when they get like they move too much. So you know a lot just by how our body responds to content. I feel like I'm biased, but I actually think that uh, the next kind of big step in uh, how we would think about a lot of problems in the business world would be adding neuroscience to them, would be actually not asking your questions, but evaluating you by looking at your brain. This is true for HR, how we're going to interview people. This is true for how we assess people when they work. This is true for how we uh, learn about our customers. Instead of asking them, we can look at them. So I think that if I were an entrepreneur right now, I would uh, make a point to befriend a neuroscientist. It's not there yet in the sense that we're uh, developing the tools, but they're still too expensive, they're too slow, they're too uh, niche, they're in academia, but not really in the business world. So I don't think that a lot of companies can afford to incorporate that in their day-to-day -day experience. The big ones, Google, Facebook, Microsoft can, and that's that's kind of where the world is heading right now. Silicon Valley is really using that a lot and, and they're gonna drive this uh, innovation. But I think that if I were an entrepreneur, I would kind of keep my finger on the pulse. I would say every two weeks, I'm going to kind of Google uh, what's up with neuroscience in business and see if there's something I can use. I would become friends with a neuroscientist and ask him or her every kind of six months, hey, what's new in your field? Because I think that at some point, it's going to be a big drive. And it's already shown that machine learning and deep learning that came from neuroscience became like the, you know, world de jour, if you want, of like almost any copy in it as analytics. I think it's going to, it's going to happen more and more frequently. And if I were starting happening right now, I would, if, if not use it already, at least keep my finger on the pulse so I would know what's happening in this field so I can be early adopter. The project that I, one of the projects I really, really liked that uh, I still believe is going to change the world is trying to understand dreams. So dreams are something that most of us experience they're very meaningful to us in the sense that we put a lot of meaning into them when we wake up. If your boyfriend woke up and tells you that he has a dream about his ex-girlfriend, you're going to be mad at the awake self. You, you, you wouldn't like say, oh, it's your brain who came up with this dream. I would blame the awake you. We, we, you know, the Bible is full of stories of people who went to wars because of dreams. Uh, his story is full of uh, hieroglyphs and caves of people drawing their dreams. It's, it's something that for, since we know ourselves, we felt it is important. And yet we're very, very poor in actually reaching out to them. All we know is what you tell us when you woke up. That's basically where we are since the days of Freud and up to now the last hundred years. We don't have really a good way to extract them, let alone change them. If you say I have bad ones, I want to change them. We're really not there yet when it comes to doing things to them. We're getting close. So the last 10 years have seen steps towards actually looking directly at brains of people and extracting content and visualizing it and getting access to the narrative of your dream. 
and that's when the technical problem comes. It's really, really hard to do this research because you're asleep. And I need to know when you're dreaming. I need to know it in real time. I need to know that you're dreaming right now. I can't say, oh, she have she has dreamt in the last 20 minutes and the dream is already lost. I have to know right away. I have to not wake you up when I try to extract things. And I'm outside your brain, not inside mostly. I can't really drill holes in your head if I'm not doing it in a clinical setting. So there's a lot of challenges there. And this is vague. Here's a specific one. One of the difficulties we have right now is to actually have a person sleep next to us with EEG. This is the device that usually reads the brain activity and have someone else look at their brain activity live while they're sleeping and say, right now the dream started. Because there's no real need for that in the clinical world. In the clinical world, when you do sleep studies, you are okay with just waiting for the end of the night and then looking at the entire night backwards. There's very few people who actually develop tools to do it in real time, to get a reading of the moment the dream is happening right now. And the tools that we have right now are not great. And this is a this is a struggle that me, my students, my colleagues are suffering with. It's very specific. It needs a push by people like the people in your group and the people who might watch this, who say, oh, that's an interesting technical problem that I think I can solve. It requires more data. We need more sleeping people. We need people that sleep with no problems. We need There's a, there's a few challenges that are all technical. Once we overcome this thing, and it should be overcome, it's, it's, it's embarrassing that we didn't solve it yet. I think we're going to make the biggest leap in understanding how dreams are, which I can assure the viewers. Every time I give a talk and I speak about the things that are interesting, dreams make everyone's eyes pop. Everyone finds it interesting. So it's something that we should just get over.